It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Marrakesh, particularly because it's the city I've called home for the last 10 years, and it's nice to see some friendly faces out there. Uh, Marrakesh wasn't always my home in Morocco. Um, straight out of college, I was hired to teach high school English at the American School of Tangier. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had some vague ideas of Morocco, deserts, spies, belly dancers. Uh, but about Tangier, I did have an imaginary image in my mind. Uh, I'd read The Sheltering Sky by Paul Bowles, um, and he's Tangier's most famous resident writer, and, and there's this great line of his about the difference between a tourist and a traveler that I still think about a lot. I'll read it to you. Another important difference between the tourist and the traveler is that the former accepts his own civilization without question, not so the traveler, who compares it with the others and rejects those elements he finds not to his liking. And so, before I'd even had my passport, obviously I decided that I was a traveler. I'd also read William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, which was written in Tangier. His Tangier is called the Interzone, and it's this fantastic place of winding Medina streets filled with hilarious and perverse characters. It was a fiction, but upon arriving in Tangier at age 22, um, I found the city just as fantastic and just as exciting and almost as hilarious and perverse. Although I had arrived, I still felt as if I was living in a fictional Tangier. Very quickly, I, I befriended Paul Bowles, um, and I would go by his apartment every Thursday afternoon to read to him. He claimed that his eyesight was going, and so I would read Flannery O'Connor or Brett Easton Ellis, and he would giggle along to the horrific violence in those books. Soon enough, I discovered that in certain situations he could hear perfectly well, uh, so I was an experiment. A few weeks into this experiment, at about 4.10 in the afternoon, he was so distressed that he was actually wringing his hands. So I wanted to know what the problem was, and his houseman, Abdul Wahid, was late for tea. And this was most unusual, because tea was always served precisely at 4. Naturally, I gallantly offered to make tea for the great man, and I fell right into his trap. <laughs> in the kitchen, there were no tea bags. As an American, I was hardly aware that tea could be done another way. Um, I was still accepting my own civilization without question. There was, however, tea in a, in a loose tin, and so I put a few spoonfuls directly into a kettle, and then rifled through kitchen drawers trying to find anything that resembled a strainer. There was nothing that resembled a strainer. And so when the kettle began to boil, I poured this pale liquid, quite ingeniously, I thought, back and forth through napkins <laughs> until I managed to get most of the tea out of what I had actually managed to get into the cup. And then I walked into the bedroom and presented the cup of pale tea to the great man. I'll always remember the theatrical wince on Paul Bowles' face as I served him that tea. I might as well have squeezed the whole lemon into that cup. Um, and just at that moment, just as Bowles had planned, I later realized, Abdul Wahid returns, headed straight for the bedroom, saw that cup of pale liquid, and completely exploded with Brett Easton Ellis violence. Bowles watched all of this as if we were a program on the Nature Channel. Then, after a while, he seemed to grow bored, and with a satisfied smile traced across his face, he said, but Abdul Wahid, Joshua didn't know. I'd grown up in a religious household, Southern Baptist, and we'd read the good book, but this was my baptism into books. And I'd earned one of my first Tangier stories, a story like those other Tangier stories I'd read and loved that would forever change my sense of the city. A couple of years ago, I was asked to write a literary history of Tangier. An incredible number of fascinating characters have lived in that city or have spent time there. Ibn Battuta, Samuel Pepys, Alexandre Dumas, Mark Twain, Edith Wharton, Jean Genet, Joe Orton, Mohammed Shukri, Tennessee Williams, Jack Kerouac, Truman Capote, we could go on. And these aren't just great writers, but what's interesting is that they were all revolutionary writers who really changed the form. So the question that really interests me as I started to write this book was, why Tangier? Why did these people come to Tangier? And there are some obvious historical, geographical, cultural reasons for that proximity to Europe, 
uh, that notorious, famous uh, Moroccan hospitality, and also then in the 20th century, the international zone, when Tangier was run by a committee of foreign powers, um, and so it was essentially lawless, and you could live however you'd like to live. Um, but with those general criteria, you could come up with a dozen other counterexamples of cities that should have had that creative aura, but they never did. So what really makes creative cities like Tangier? I had a sense that the answer was in what had first drawn me to Tangier. It was a city, like other great cities, that had been created not just by architecture or planning, but by fictions and memories. Most of you probably have your great Paris memories. The little bistro hidden away where you had that dinner, or that corner where you met that man or that woman. Uh, or your vivid New York memories, or maybe your vivid Naples memories with Vesuvius off in the distance. There are some cities throughout history that just seem made to create stories and memories. Tangier is one of those. And so instead of setting out to write a dry chronological history of the city, of who arrived in 1854, who said what in 1917, I started mapping the places in Tangier that were haunted not only by the great writers who had lived there, but also by the fictional characters that they created. I started creating what I called imaginary maps maps of the ghosts who had moved through the city streets. Because this is what great cities have in common. You sense the ghosts of the past, fictional and real, moving through the streets. So what enables the ghosts to live on after death? What keeps them haunting a city? First of all, memories and ghosts need a landscape. Memories need to be situated geographically. Think of all the personal stories you're fond of telling, and they almost always begin with geography. We were driving down the highway. I just walked out of the bar, when? That's how memory works. Memory needs a landscape. This summer, I was having lunch with friends in an old house in the south of France. And after we'd eaten, still seated at the table, our host invited us to play a memory game with a technique he just learned. You may know this technique. Imagine having to remember a long shopping list. Now imagine walking through your childhood home and placing the items in this list in consecutive rooms. For example, to start the list, three carrots and four 500 gram sacks of white flour. So you walk into the entryway and you see these three enormous carrots nodding their leafy heads at you. You move on to the kitchen and at the table are seated four giant sacks of flour. They're playing poker and in front of them, each of them are 500 stacks of white chips. Okay? I could go on through that house and tell you exactly what that shopping list was this summer as could everybody else who was at that lunch, I'm sure. Notice three things. Memory needs a landscape. We need to recognize the landscape. You put these things in your childhood home, which will always remain in your mind. And details make the memory stick. These sacks of flour play poker. What's particularly interesting to me about this is that's what's happening in the brain as memories are made. It's also geographical. Recent research shows that a memory is created by forming a connection between separate neurons in the brain. That's an image of what's happening. Those connections will always exist once a memory is made, but we strengthen those connections by calling them up more and more often and reinforcing the links. So even in our mind, our memories are maps. And interesting, it looks a lot like a Moroccan Medina. You've probably followed the demonstrations in Istanbul's Taksim Square that began this summer. There have been demonstrations all across that region, but this one's unique. The protesters are young and old. They come from opposite political parties. They have been demonstrating against the redevelopment of the square into a modern shopping center, and their protests have threatened to bring down the government. This positive protest is interesting in so many ways, but what interests me today is how these protest protesters are essentially defending their city and their identity as citizens of that city by defending their memories and their stories. Taksim has traditionally been a gathering place of generations. If you're an Istanbulite, Taksim Square is on your local map of the places you love. And what's happening in Turkey right now is that all of these memories, these maps in people's minds, are being overlaid. People gather in the square where their memories are located, and they don't want the square to change because then, slowly, their memories will be lost. The power of Taksim Square and any other magical place is that it appears on the, on the imaginary map of many, many people. Taksim Square is their square, and that makes all the difference. 
As I wrote my book on Tangier, I became more and more fascinated by the idea of these imaginary maps. As we travel, we find places and we put them, we make them our own. Uh, so let me tell you, for example, a bit about my Paris map. The Champs Elysees is not on my map. Montmartre is there, but it's faint, as if it's almost been erased. But there is Chez Lip on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, where I was always taken to dinner by the headmaster who brought me to Tangier and introduced me to Paul Bowles. Now when I eat there, I insist on sitting at the same table, and so the memories are reinforced and added to, just like the synapses between neurons. And although I've never much enjoyed browsing the bookstalls along the Seine, there is Gide on my map, skipping school in his novel The Counterfeiters, finding a treasured book to read. Of course, my map has many more points than that, and I'm guessing if we overlaid your Paris map on mine, we'd have many points in common. And imagine if we overlaid all the personal imaginary maps of Paris that anyone's ever consciously or unconsciously made. That's Paris. More than any Paris you'll ever see flipping through an atlas. And this is my point. The greatest cities are those that many people throughout history have had stories to tell about. And our, imagining map, our imaginary maps are much more important to a city's survival than anything else. The Italian architect Aldo Rossi wrote about this in the 1960s in his The Architecture of the City, which is fascinating, which I'd recommend to anybody who's interested in these questions. We've talked about memories needing a landscape and about landscapes needing permanence, both points that Rossi makes, but he's also interested in what he calls the individuality of urban artifacts. This is our third requirement of a magical place. It is unique, it's individual. The four sacks of flower play poker. But for Rossi, the individuality of a place is not just aesthetic. It's not just a beautiful building or a particularly charming street. For him, places have magic because they are the physical signs of our biographies. These magical places hold our stories, literally. I've given you some of my biography and some of the places that are the physical signs of my biography but I'm just one person. Rossi is most interested in what he calls the collective memory, all the memories that people have about a certain place and which the place still contains, literally. It's Taksim Square again. The place people cannot bear to see destroyed, not really for political or economic reasons, but for deeply personal reasons. Destroy a place, either by tearing it down or making it look too much like another place, and you destroy the memories attached to that place. Rossi made these incredible sketches of cities in which the places that hold memories are very clear and even drawn at a larger scale than the other places, and the places that don't have memories fade and become smaller. This is exactly the way we think of cities in our minds, a loose collection of personal places, some of which are more detailed than others. One thing I've realized is that in the economic and political system in which we now live, it's almost impossible for an, individual, for an individual to have the power to keep a building from coming down or a park from becoming a parking lot. Even if we band together to defend our memories, the economics of development are such that it, they're almost always more powerful. Hopefully, Taksim Square will be the exception to that rule. And that seems rather bleak. So what can we do as individuals to make other Parises and Tangiers? How can we, as individuals, make great cities? Is that even possible? I think our greatest power as placemakers is to understand that our movement through the city is a work of art. What does your map look like? Are there many different points on your map, or just a few? If your map is just home and office and a few restaurants, your map is not very artistic. Hanging on the wall, you're not going to win any prizes. Great art, like great places, and great maps, requires detail and specificity. Well, I'm not exactly the adventurous type, you may say. I'm not boring, I'm just a little more conservative, I'm a little more cautious. I prefer to follow a map made by an experienced map maker. I'm not really the explorer type who sails the oceans and makes the maps. Well, here's what I would say. We're all map makers, and we don't have a choice in the matter. Every instant we move through the world, we're making a map. Every connection with a person or a place goes on to our imaginary maps. But memories and stories only stick to the unique places, the places that somehow stand out. So if you're automatically engaged in this process anyway, simply by being alive, why not discover new places in your cities to tell stories about? Places you would never otherwise venture to, because this is how great cities are made, and great art, and great lives. 
Tangier or Paris or Naples wouldn't be legendary if others hadn't created many stories in those places. And in doing so, they protected those places. So we too, simply by fully engaging with the world around us, can teach our cities how to become. What this is also is an argument against routine. If your map just has a few places on it labeled home, school, shopping, you're cheating your memories. And whole sections of the world will slowly disappear, like in Aldo Rossi's drawings. If the inhabitants of a whole city choose to make uncreative maps, over time the city will lose its character and its ability to hold memories and stories in its walls. So if we love our cities and we want them to be creative places for centuries, like Tangier, where you can still feel the ghosts moving through town, our only solution is to walk out of this room, stroll down the street, open our eyes, engage, and live. And I'll see you out there. Thanks.